American Memorial Endowments mission is to build, preserve, and maintain tangible reminders of the shared values for which Filipinos, Americans, and their allies fought in World War II. Among FAME's many projects is the Death March Markers, 138 in all, spanning the provinces of Bataan, Pampanga, and Tarlac. These silent white obelisks stand as mute reminders of the 138-kilometer path taken after the fall of Bataan by nearly 75,000 Filipino and American soldiers. Now known as the Bataan Death March, this atrocious march from Bataan to Camp O'Donnell in Capas Tarlac lasted many days. Countless marchers perished due to disease, starvation, and from the needless cruelty of the Japanese guards. At Camp O'Donnell, now Kapas National Shrine, can be found the original boxcar where the POWs were loaded onto during the death march and the battling bastards of Bataan Memorial, which fame helps fund and maintain. The Hellships Memorial, a beautiful memorial of black granite located on the shores of Subic Bay, was built by fame in 2006. This memorial honors the thousands of World War II Allied prisoners of war transported under horrific conditions on hell ships and scattered all across Asia to work as slave laborers to support the Japanese war effort. Thousands died of starvation, disease, murder, and neglect. The hell ships remain among the most senseless atrocities of World War II. Through the memorials we build, fame offers a tangible reminder to the present generation of the heroism, courage, and sacrifices of our veterans, martyrs, and heroes, and aims to reaffirm the enduring hope of a world set free from war. The Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation is an organization for initiating, developing, and producing projects and activities that will educate and enlighten the Filipino people about our World War II history. By commissioning and sponsoring films, literary works, and other multimedia platforms, we envision to bring the stories of our fathers and grandfathers to light, their enormous sacrifices to free our country from foreign aggression during the darkest days of World War II. Through these stories, we aim to inspire the youth to emulate the characteristics of our heroes and to continually aspire for peace. With key Templars of World War II history as the Foundation's Board of Trustees, its ultimate goal is to build a museum and library as a dedicated repository of World War II archives, documents, and relics. A state-of-the-art museum aimed not only for learning and education, but more importantly, to honor our glorious past and inspire our future generations. Look right, Pepito. Show these people that you are brave. He was one of the greatest Filipinos, not just in World War II, but one of the greatest in the whole of Philippine history. Kung basahin mo talaga ang kwento ni Jose Abad Santos, mamamangha ka. He was one of the prominent government officials with integrity. A man of character like Jose Abad Santos, given 30 years of public service would stay true to his word. He died as a hero under the most difficult period of Philippine history. He believed what he said. He stood by what he said. And rather than sacrifice his ideals and his honor, he chose to pay with his life. Yung honor niya hindi nabali. Talagang marangal siyang namatay, humarap sa kamatayan. Not even the Japanese army could break him. The example of Abad Santos is still as current today as it was in 1942. Tragic as it was, 
what he lived for and eventually what he died for is something that we have to keep remembering. He died for selflessness. He died for maintaining integrity and he chose honor above all. We'd like to welcome participants from all over the Philippines, from the U.S., from U.K., and we have even one from Italy. Uh, and for those who would have questions, you can type in your questions. For those on Zoom, you can type in your questions in the chat box. For those on FB Live, you can type it on the comments section. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions for uh, Mr. Sides. Now, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. American historian Hampton Sides is the author of numerous New York Times best-selling books, including Ghost Soldiers, Americana, Blood and Thunder, Hellhound on His Trail, In the Kingdom of Ice, and On Desperate Ground. Ghost Soldiers, which tells the harrowing story of the raid on the Cabanatuan POW camp in the Philippines, has sold more than a million copies worldwide, has been translated into more than a dozen languages, and was the basis for the 2005 film, The Great Raid, which is incidentally showing in Netflix in the Philippines now. <laughs> a contributor to such publications as National Geographic, The American Scholar, Smithsonian, Time, Outside, The New York Times, and The New Yorker, his journalistic works have been frequently anthologized and have twice been named finalists at the National Magazine Awards. A native of Memphis and a graduate of Yale, Hampton is a member of the Society of American Historians and was a recent fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. He's now at work on a book about the fateful final voyage of British navigator Captain James Cook. Hampton lives with, with his wife, Anne, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride and pleasure that we bring to you today the one who started me on World War II history. <laughs> My friend and birthday boy, Mr. Hampton Sides. <laughs> Hampton, the mic is yours. Hello, hello. Thank you so much, Desiree. And, and it's so good to be back in the Philippines, at least virtually. Uh, I wish I could be there in person with you to celebrate and commemorate. Um, I guess it's more commemorate the events of World War II, now the 80th uh, anniversary uh, but unfortunately, COVID has kind of messed things up. And so we have to do these virtual uh, Zoom meetings, which are really fascinating in and of themselves. They're great. They're the, ne the next best thing, right? But at least we have them. Uh, otherwise, we, we wouldn't be communicating at all. So I have to, um, I, I guess there's the silver lining of all this. Uh, I'm from New Mexico, as, as Desiree mentioned, but uh, I'm, I'm in Hawaii. Um, on the big island of Hawaii right now, here to celebrate um, six decades of of my bothersome presence on planet Earth. Uh, I, I'm 60 years old as of two days ago, so my family wanted to celebrate here with me. So that's where where I am right now. Um, it you know I'm trying to remember now. It's been a long time, of course, since I published the book Ghost Soldiers. It's been 21 years, which is hard for me to believe. Um, but I go back further to really what sparked my interest in the Philippines and World War II and Bataan, uh, which was an event that happens every year in New Mexico on April 9th, which is the day of the surrender at Bataan. And in New Mexico, they hold something called the Bataan Memorial Death March, uh, which is actually a military marathon that's held in the White Sands Missile Range in the middle of the desert of southern New, Me New Mexico. And um, I went down there to do a story about this event for the magazine Sports Illustrated. And uh, because I had heard that there was an older man in his uh, late 80s who was going to run and partially run, but mostly walk all 26 miles of this marathon in the, in the New, New Mexico uh, desert uh, because he was a veteran of the real baton and he had survived all this all the 
tread you know, all the you know all, all the sacrifices and all the had, ordeals that all these men had gone through. So many of them had died. Well, he had survived all that and had a had had a good life and wanted to to walk those twenty six miles to to remember his friends who had who who hadn't made it. So I wrote the story uh, in in the in the desert uh, with this with this man. Uh, who had told me told me about the Cabana Tawan raid? He said, "You know, I I uh, was there all the way to the bitter end, and I was at Cabana Tawan, of course. And you know all about that raid, of course, uh, that rescued those men at Cabana Tawan. Of course, I had never heard about it. It was really not at all part of the national shorthand, at least in the United States, um, that I thought it should be. This amazing story of a." highly successful rescue late in the war um, that uh, was undertaken by this extraordinary group of men called the U- U.S. Rangers, this new, this new force uh, that was still an experimental force. Um, as, soon as, this, as soon as we crossed the, the, the uh, threshold at the end of the Memorial Death March in New Mexico, I knew that I had a book. I, I, I just knew it in my gut that, that this, this was a great, great stirring story uh, about um, coming back, you know, coming back for your own people, uh, about redemption. Uh, and really, when MacArthur said, I shall return, it was emblematic of that, that we did return. The United States at least came back for, both to liberate uh, the Philippines and fulfill those promises to the whole nation, uh, but also to fulfill the promise, I shall return for my own men, you know, the, the ones that had been left at Bataan, stranded there uh, and f- during the siege in the fall and the, and the death march. So um, so I got a, somehow or another, got a book contract because this was really the first book, you know, I've since gone on to write a bunch of books, but that was my first serious book. And I got a co- contract with Doubleday to write about it. And I spent two, three years working on it. Uh, and of course, by and large, or by far the most thrilling part of this, the most meaningful and significant for me was getting to know these veterans uh, because they were coming to the end of their lives, but they still were live wires. They had a lot to say and they <laughs> uh, remembered those events all those years ago so vividly. So I went around the country and I went around the world interviewing these veterans, uh, both American and Filipino, um, to try to get a a real kind of visceral sense of what this experience was like. Because the book book is about the entire arc of of the experience from from the surrender on April 9th to their final um, rescue in 1945, January of 1945. Uh, and so getting to know this guy, I mean, the, and the thing about them was, you know, the, I think it was Tom Brokaw called them the, you know, the greatest generation. Um, but I, I always ended up calling them the, the earliest generation because they would always call me up like it's six in the morning, you know, like, let's get started. Let's go. <laughs> you know, these are early risers. These are the kind of guys that like to get up at dawn and I like to sleep in. So the, the, the first several months of the research involved getting up really early and getting on the phone with these guys and then finally going to see them in person and uh, uh, including and especially um, for me, maybe the most meaningful interview that I did, I'm going to call up a slide here uh, was with a young man, uh, an old man who was once a young man. And this is a picture of him when he was uh, Captain Prince. This would be slide number, number eight. You can get that up. Uh, Captain Captain Prince was the man who, uh, I don't know if it's gotten, has it gotten up there yet? Um, was, was the guy who really designed this raid. He was, he was a young Stanford graduate uh, who uh, was, was called upon to figure out a way to go behind enemy lines, 30 miles behind enemy lines, um, to rescue these last survivors of the Bataan Death March, 500 of the sickliest, 
and 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 the you know those who who, who had been starving and suffered from beriberi and malaria and dysentery and so many diseases to um to rescue these 500 men um most of them americans but there were also some who were from uh great britain uh norway i think the netherlands um and these were sort of the last remnants of those who had surrendered three years earlier at Bataan. Uh, so, Captain, so is that photo up? I can't, um, I'm not sure. I don't see it on my screen, but that's the young Captain Prince. Um, I thought maybe we'd show him as an older man. Um, flat slide number nine. Uh, this was when I interviewed him in Seattle, Washington, where he, uh, where he lives or where he lived. He is, unfortunately, like so many of these veterans that I interviewed, almost all of them, in fact, um, they've all passed on now. But uh, Captain Prince was just an extraordinarily pragmatic young man who had very little military training, but somehow found himself in this position with this great responsibility of designing a raid to, to rescue 500 of his fellow countrymen. And uh, he was very modest, but he was very clear and stubborn in, in his ideas. Uh, he, and he's the, he's the one that was sort of the architect of, um, of the raid and made it, uh, you know, when you look back on it and sort of analyze it in hindsight, uh, the chess moves that he made and the decisions that he made um, were actually brilliant and uh, kind of a perfect example of a civilian soldier because he, he was briefly in the military, and as soon as he got, as soon as the war was over, he went home, went into business, and never looked back. Uh, but was very proud, very, very, you know, m proud but uh, modest about that accomplishment as being the highest, the best, the most exciting, the most just invigorating accomplishment of his life. Um, so that's Captain. Um, that's Captain Prince. So at the end of the war, getting near the end of the war, as MacArthur was returning to the Philippines, the Japanese began to realize that they were going to overtake the Philippines. They were going to, you know, it was just a matter of time, but MacArthur would succeed in that. So an order came down from the high command <clears throat> about the prisoners of war that were stashed in various prison camps in, the, in Asia. And this order basically said, uh, it was called a kill all order, which was to execute all the prisoners of war um, because they didn't want them to fall back into American hands and then get healthy and get back in a uniform, put a, you know, have a rifle and go back into the war. Um, so the decision was made to massacre one by one the men of these different camps. Um, a, sh a few days before the Cabanatuan raid, not long before, there was, in fact, the first of these liquidations, these exterminations of POWs. Uh, this was at uh, Palawan, uh, on the island of Palawan, uh, Porta Princesa uh, POW camp. Uh, I've forgotten the number now, but I believe it was about 150 Americans were were incinerated. They were they poured gasoline on them and lit, lit them and, and and incinerated it. Almost every one of them. But there were a few survivors who escaped and got to MacArthur's command. Got the word of mouth to MacArthur's command that this was what the Japanese were doing in these camps. And so this lit a fire under MacArthur and his Sixth Army under the command of General Walter Kruger. Uh, to do something about the remaining prisoner war camps that were known to be on, um, on, on Luzon. Combatant Tawan being the largest at its, at one time there was as many as 9,000 POWs in that camp, uh, but also Santo Tomas, um, Bil uh, Bilibid, um, uh, I've forgotten the others, but you know, the, oh, there's so many uh, that were uh, Los Banos, the, the other one. And, there were rescue plans drawn up for all of these camps, but the first one was Cabanatuan. And <clears throat> Captain Prince, along with his commander, uh, Henry Musi, um, 
the, who was in command of the six army rangers got this assignment to go behind enemy lines and with the help of the Filipino guerrillas who who worked and who fought in in those re, and lived in those regions around Nueva Ecija province um, to go in and uh, pull off a massive prison break uh, in the middle of the night. It was, it was designed to be a night raid. Uh, so that's what they did. The, the U.S. Army Rangers, um, a unit that was really untested at that point and was still considered in many ways experimental, um, was, was given this assignment, a very interesting assignment, a very cool assignment, one that many uh, would have signed up for. Um, but nonetheless, one that tested, you know, is this exactly what are these special operations forces supposed to be about? Uh, the Rangers, you know, stealth and, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, preserving that element of surprise and, and uh, uh, you know, all the different elements that are supposed to go into special operations. But um, this was still new in the in the history of, of this organization. So in, in a sense, it was a mission that tested just exactly what a ranger was supposed to be in the first place. Um, so uh, I guess the next thing to say is just, you know, I don't want to give away the entire plot of the story or the entire plot of the book, but most of you in the Philippines generally know it, but uh, they, they did go behind enemy lines. They did find out that there were large numbers of Imperial Japanese forces nearby um, something like 5,000 were camped within earshot across the river from the camp. Uh, another 1,000 were located elsewhere. And then an 8,000, as many as 8,000 were in the city of Cabanatuan. So they began to really worry that this could be a bloodbath if they didn't pull this off just exactly right. Um, so, you know, one of the elements, and, and, and I don't, I don't, we don't have hours and hours to go into this, so I'll be brief in saying that, you know, they came up with a lot of, you know, almost by the seat of their pants, improvising, they came up with a lot of different um, unique elements to an operation like this. And, and one of them was this. They knew that they were going to have to be crawling on their bellies with their rifles through about nearly an hour of daylight because the camp was surrounded by flat country that had been clipped close to the ground so that there was, so that the guards in the towers of the camp would have a lot of visibility. <clears throat> so the Rangers came up with the idea of sending an airplane and I'll ask you to put up another slide if you can, uh, slide number six. Um, the idea was to bring a, an airplane to fly overhead during that critical 30 minutes or so that the men would be crawling across the, the rice paddies and the flatlands to get to the camp. This plane would be overhead just circling, just circling so that the guards would be looking up instead of looking down. And that would give the rangers just that little extra bit of time uh, to preserve the element of, of surprise. And you know what, it worked. And I don't know if that slide got up there, but it is a beautiful, beautiful plane. And uh, normally it's painted black. This one I think is painted sort of a, a gunmetal gray or, or, or a, a green, but it's, uh, it, it was a plane that uh, could elude radar to, to a certain extent. It was kind of an experimental aircraft in many ways a reconnaissance plane, uh, but it uh, the point was it was weird looking. The Japanese had never seen it before and they were very curious about it uh, as it started to fly overhead, <clears throat> right over the camp, kept circling, kept circling. At some point they, they figured the Japanese would start shooting at it, but they didn't. Uh, and they this kept circling and it, and it worked brilliantly and the, and the rangers were able to get almost to the almost to the gates of the prison uh, so it was an operation that had many different um uh just a lot of ingenuity uh a lot of other elements were involved uh including a force called the alamo scouts which had been uh strictly kind of a reconnaissance intelligence gathering force uh 
w- with a storied with a, a storied career already in in the in the uh, in World War II, uh, but they were brought in to just scout the camp, to take measurements, to try to figure out where all the different guard stations were and where all the, you know, if there were troops in inside the camp, where were they? Which barracks were reserved for the prisoners of war? All of those details. The Alamo scouts went in there with with uh, some of uh, the Filipino guerrillas. Uh, who were who knew the camp well, knew this area extremely well under uh, uh, Captain Juan Pajota. Uh, and I should show let's show a picture of Juan Pajota because he figures he's one of the great heroes of this story as well. That would be slide number three if you can call that up. Um, Juan Pajota was captain of a guerrilla force in that part of uh, the rural countryside around the camp. Uh, and had a, I mean, you can see the fierceness in his face and the, the determination and, and the, uh, it, was, it was apparently a, a, a truly, uh, uh, you know, born, a born warrior, let's say, and a born leader. Um, Juan Pajota uh, w- was brought in to not only provide intelligence about the camp, but also to bring his entire guerrilla force in to fight off the Japanese um, to prevent them from crossing the river uh, and coming to the aid of, of, their, of the Japanese guards. So uh, he ends up playing a, a major role in, in, the, uh, in the story and, and uh, was, was justly honored um, both by the Philippine government and the U.S. government for, for his uh, involvement in the story. I can't remember if we've shown a picture of Henry Musi, the, the man who ran, I, I said Prince was the architect of the raid, but Musi was in, was in command and was a charismatic leader who, of, this, of the six army rangers who had trained them in New, in New Guinea and who had really created this force. Uh, so hopefully he, his photo is up there. Um, Musi, really colorful guy with a mustache. He kind of looked like a maitre d from a restaurant. Uh, he uh, was incredibly fit and was a, a tough, a tough leader who had trained these guys in the jungles of New Guinea, and um, they loved him. Uh, they feared him, maybe a little bit, as you fear all great commanders, I guess. Uh, and uh, he, of course also was honored um, by the, you know, by the army and by the U.S. government for, for this successful raid. The other factor I think that is important to, the other element that made this a successful raid, we mentioned the, the Rangers, we've mentioned the, the Filipino guerrillas under Juan Pajota, but we haven't mentioned the civilians uh, and the villages all around there. Uh, and in Cabanatuan City. Uh, and let's call up, a, a, if we can, slide number one. Uh, one of the key elements that made this raid a success <clears throat> was that the Rangers realized that these prisoners of war, many of them, they couldn't walk. They couldn't, you know, Certainly, they couldn't run out of that camp. They may, might be able to limp out of that camp. Many of them couldn't walk because they were the sickest of the sick and the weakest of the weak, and they had many diseases. Uh, so the idea was hatched to go to the surrounding villages and ask the farmers there in, in the rice paddies, the cane fields, uh, to... Um, to provide their carabao and their carabao carts and to, uh, uh, w- which represents a, a huge risk. Think about it from their point of view as farmers. This is their livelihood. And this is, uh, they need those <laughs> very desperately. Uh, not only that, but by committing to the American return, uh, they would be endangering their lives uh, because of the Japanese, if they got wind of it, uh, would certainly retaliate. Um, so it was a very risky and brave thing to do, but uh, Juan Pajota and uh, Eduardo Hosan, the other guerrilla leader, were able to muster, 
I can't remember, remember, but it's scores and scores, maybe even a hundred um, of these buffalo carts and buffalo that were waiting at the river uh, so that when the rescue took place, uh, these men could at least get to the river, hopefully. Many of them had to be carried literally in, in, in these men's, you know, the rangers bare hands um, to the river. And then they would be able to lie down on these carts and go the 30 miles back to American lines up and over the, over the, you know, over the valley and through the towns and all this rural area in these Buffalo carts. So <clears throat> I think you have to give credit almost equally, I think, to all of these groups, um, the Rangers, the Alamo Scouts, the guerrillas and the civilians, um, in addition to the Air Force that provided, or the, the Air, it wasn't quite called the Air Force yet, but the uh, Air Command that provided that interesting looking P-61 P Black Widow aircraft. Um, so, you know, but somehow or another, you know, a lot of these operations go, go, you know, go haywire. They don't work. Something happens. But in this case, the, the gods were smiling on uh, Henry Musi and Captain Prince, and they got every one of those prisoners out of there. Um, at least they got them out of out of the gates. Unfortunately, there were, I believe, two casualties um, along the way among the POWs. Um, who were just, as it turned out, really just too sickly and too too fragile and 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 uh, you know in in sorry state of health to move. Um, there was a a casual the two casualties among the rangers. Uh, um, there was the doctor, the, the the man who had been brought there to to treat the casualties that were expected in this raid. Instead, he was the casualty. Uh, he got he 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 took fire uh, from a mortar round and and he died um, early the next morning. Um, and then there was a, a case of friendly fire. One of the rangers was was apparently shot by one of his own men accidentally in the in the hellacious fair fight a firefight that happened you know at the moment of a, a, that the uh, <clears throat> camp was attacked. So yes, there were some casualties, but. You know, given the um, stakes here, given what could have happened if these men had not been rescued, um, the stakes were considered to be very, I mean, the, the casualties were considered to be very, very low. Um, so it was some pictures here. Um, maybe if you could bring up slide number 10. Uh, the, you know, they made it back with, in the, at the plodding pace provided by the Carabao in their Carabao carts, but they made it back to enemy lines uh, the next day. They marched all through the night across rivers and, and streams and across the rice paddies. Uh, and uh, these, this is a picture of Captain Prince uh, uh, really celebrating with one of the guerrillas that he had fought with uh, that night. It wasn't just a. It wasn't just a. You know, uh, a raid, in the sense of, yes, it was a successful prison break, a liberation, but it was also a battle. Um, the, the fiercest part of the battle was with uh, Captain Juan Pajota, uh, as expected. The Japanese heard all of this gunfire over at the prison camp, and they started to get worried, and they started to run across the river uh, to to defend the prison camp. But Juan Pajota and his men were there to, if you could bring up uh, slide number four, uh, this is, these are some of his men, some of the guerrillas that uh, fought that night. Um, they fought fiercely and they fought off the Japanese that were in many ways better equipped and, and, and even more experienced in battle. Uh, but not a single one of the Japanese made it across the river uh, to defend the camp. And that was critical, absolutely critical to the success as well. Um, it, this is an operation that has since uh, since it happened in the United States uh, and militaries all over the world study this operation because it is textbook. It, it, everything kind of worked in lockstep. Um, it was a great example of you know cooperating with 
civilians and local forces and, um, you know, using all the different elements uh, of, available to you from, you know, from the air and from the ground and uh, intelligence forces that provided uh, the critical intelligence that led to the, to, to the success of the raid. So it's just, um, it's studied at West Point. It's studied at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, at the Ranger School. Um, and it's become quite well known. Uh, I'd like to think part of the reason it's, it's well known in the United States is because of my book, Ghost Soldiers. But uh, there have been other books and other documentaries. And then, of course, there was a pretty well-known uh, film that was, uh, that Desiree alluded to, The Great Raid. Let's put up that poster um, it's slide number 20. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, so the movie, you know, the book came out in 2001 and uh, the movie uh, came out in 2005. And uh, actually I was there in Manila for the premiere of it, the Philippine premiere of it. Um, you know, I, th I think it came out well. It was, it was uh, certainly historically accurate, accurate. I thought it was. And so, uh, so I think so did... Uh, Captain Prince and others who were consulted on the film uh, didn't do it. Didn't do tremendously well commercially or critically, but it, it has since kind of um, really found its audience in um, digital form uh, on Netflix, and uh, you know, and it is more than more than made up for uh, for itself in, in sales, international sales, ever since uh, the digital age. So it's got it's got a following. Um, I went down to the to the movie set where they were filming the Great Raid in Australia, and I, of course I, they wanted to film it in the Philippines. They should have filmed it in the Philippines, but for a variety of reasons they didn't. They filmed it in New Zealand. I'm mean, excuse me in Australia, and so I went down to Australia to the movie set in uh, Queensland, and uh, <clears throat> it took me there at night. They were about to film. One of the big scenes where the ra rangers are sending on the camp lots of grenades and bazookas and fire fighting going on. And um, it was very exciting. I, you know, I went down there and, and suddenly I was transported to a prison camp in the Philippines in World War II. <laughs> it looked so accurate. They spent so much money on it. It was spooky in a way. But um all this fire, all, you know, all these explosions and all, all this ammunition. And, and then um, in the commotion, a kangaroo just began to hop across the front of the camera. <laughs> a kangaroo, because, you know, this was Australia. And, of course, the director's like, cut, cut, cut. We can't, we can't, have, a, we can't have a kangaroo in the film. Um, because, you know, it's like, <laughs> it was just one of the many hazards of trying to film it in, in the wrong country. But um, it was an interesting process to, um, to see how a book is turned into a movie and how the screenwriters have to think about the, telling the same story in a different way. Um, it's an interesting uh, and not always wonderful uh, process to see a book, you know, just kind of converted into something else, but, um, but it is interesting. And, and I think in the end, uh, it was a worthwhile movie. I don't know how many of your, um, how, how many of the listeners today saw it, uh, but it's, um, you know, probably the best thing that's been done on, you, uh, you know, on the, although there've been some really, really good documentaries about the death March and about the combatant to one raid as well. But um, in terms of dramatic performances, the great raid, I guess, is the best. So, so that's kind of my, the overview of the book um, and how I got into it. Um, I would love to hear because I do think that many of you have read the book, uh, or at least I'm told that. Um, I'd love to hear from from you. Any any questions about <coughs> how I how I wrote it and you know how I, I went about the research or really anything at all? But um, I would love to hear from you. Hi, Hampton. Thank you for that uh, wonderful story. I've, there's a lot of uh, questions in my mind that have been answered by your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the kangaroo part. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it's, it's really one of the, the, well, because I'm a World War II history geek and fan, so you know, I reveled in that movie and I've watched it maybe 
10, more than 10 times. And my kids, because they don't have any, uh, you know, choice, <laughs> have watched it more than 10 times with me as well. Um, it's a great movie. Uh, I think it's still watching, uh, it's still streaming on Netflix. Uh, yeah. My only comment about that, the production design was really good. Having been involved in, you know, making uh, documentary films here, I know the hard work it entails to make it as accurately as possible. My only contention there was that um, it was not that hot. They, they never sweated. <laughs> they don't have the tropical heat, you know. <laughs> I said it would be more accurate if I can see you know, um, uh, Benjamin Bratt sweating and <laughs> really just a joke. Yeah, just yeah, a joke. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, we've got some questions from the audience. Um, many are on FB Live. Sorry for the Zoom. We can't um, flash the, the slides here, but on FB Live, uh, everything is right there, complete. If, if, you can, okay. if you can, you know, replay it later, um, we'll, we'll, we'll iron that out in our next episode. Yeah, it's no a very problem. insightful presentation and... Um, Really, having read this book in early 2000s, I told Hampton, my, my, my older kids were then just really toddlers. And now they're in college and almost working. And that has been that, it has been that long. But, you know, I still remember it like the back of my hand. It's one of the, you know, the, the, one of the very few books that really got me into World War II history. So um, there's many questions here. Uh, I'll read the first one. Um, Hampton, how many Filipino casualties were there? Maybe in Pahota and Hoson's side? Well, on uh, it said, you know, starting with the death march part of it, I, I, it said that as many as 70,000 Filipinos may have died during the, the fall of Bataan and, and, the, and, the, and the death march. Um, I don't think the census is very accurate. I don't know that we know for for a fact, um, but w once they got to O'Donnell, uh, the casualties were astonishing, both for the Filipinos and the Americans. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I'm sorry. It's been, as I say, 21 years. I'm, I'm a little bit rusty on some of the numbers, but uh, the casualties were still continuing to be very extreme for the Filipino soldiers. Um, once they got to Cabana to Juan, as far as I know, there weren't any more, um, or at least not large numbers of Filipinos. Uh, at Cabana Tawan. They were separated out and um, uh, they may have had their own camp there briefly uh, as, the, as the Japanese try to kind of separate the Americans from the Filipinos. All right. Sorry, I've been I there. I've been having problems with my mute button. <laughs> Next question. This is from Emerson Uy. This is a very nice question, Hampton. Did you try to speak with any Japanese who were involved in the prison camp? Or maybe just any Japanese uh, of their perspective of the, the whole thing? Yes, yes. Um, I did have an opportunity to go to Tokyo uh, for one month. Uh, well, I was in Japan for three months. But Tokyo for one month to um, it, was, it was a fellowship um, offered by something called the Japan Society, and the reason I went to Japan was I wanted to try to understand, to the extent possible, the Japanese point of view on all this. Uh, and you know, I, 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 you know, reject the the idea that you know the Japanese are you know just sort of you know innately cruel or something like that. You know, there, there was something about the ethos of that army. There was something about uh, the, the way that that army was structured and that society <coughs> under Kojo was structured that led to the led to the cr gratuitous cruelty that we saw and the mistreatment of POWs all over Asia, not, not just the Americans. I wanted to try to understand that a little bit. And um, I don't know that I... I don't know that going there gave me all the answers by any means, but um, I did interview a number of Japanese um, soldiers, you know, rather elderly veterans at that point who had been soldiers um, in the Philippines, one of whom had been at the death march. Uh, 
he said, although he called it, he said, your so-called death march. He didn't uh, acknowledge that it was anything unusual other than that war is horrible. And, uh, you know, we were, he said they were unprepared for the huge numbers of, of both American and Filipino soldiers who would surrender. They had made projections that were somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 and in, in fact, nearly 100,000 surrendered. Uh, so, you know, these, you know, I'm not defending the Japanese point of view here. I'm just stating what, what they said, which was that we didn't see it as a death march at all. We were overwhelmed. We were starving uh, ourselves. We were not well supplied by the Imperial High Command. Uh, and we had to march these guys somewhere. Uh, and we could have just shot them all. <laughs> one of them, he did say that at one point. We could have just done, some, you know, gotten rid of the problem, but we tried to keep them alive. This was their point of view. I don't know um, if I was ever convinced, but um, this was um, what this one soldier said to me. Um, but I do think it's important to understand, um, you know, that the Japanese had a very different notion about surrendering. You know, uh, you're, never, you're never supposed to surrender under any circumstances. And we, we certainly saw that in the this horrible fighting at places like Iwo Jima. Um, even when the odds were obviously 100% against you, um, you can't, you never surrender. And that's, it causes shame to you and your name and your soul. And it causes shame to your family and back in Japan. Um, so, if they had that mentality inculcated in their culture and their military culture, um, think about how they would regard American and Filipinos who just one day laid down their arms and said, we give up, we surrender. Uh, they, they thought that these men were weak and were, you know, uh, dishonor, dishonorable for having surrendered. So that mentality certainly worked its way down. Uh, to the to the individual acts of brutality that you saw um, on the death march, and with that, I'm going to move because the sun is right in my face. <laughs> this is better. Well, you're in sunny Hawaii. <laughs> That's really wonderful. I can't play, I can't complain okay. too much. <laughs> We've got some more questions. A very nice uh, view, uh, you know, perspective from the Japanese. I've I've also read another diary of a Japanese soldier who fought here, and you know it's, it's kind of nice to look at it from their point of view as well. And mm -hmm. and um, I'm really amazed at how they are so still loyal to the emperor and to the imperial Japanese army, despite the fact that you know a lot of them were you know fending for themselves or something like that here. Anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we've got a lot of questions to cover. Next question, Mr. Sides, is from Ron Gonzalez of California. Ron is my good friend. Um, his question is, what was it like interviewing Filipino veterans? Oh, well, I, you know, that, the, well, you know, I'm from the South originally. I, I grew up in Memphis and we pride ourselves on Southern hospitality. Um, but the Filipinos um, have us beat, I'm afraid, uh, in the hospitality department. Uh, once I, you know, getting to, to the Philippines, um, and doing my research everywhere I went, um, I had a hard time interviewing people because they all wanted to feed me and have parties and, uh, you know, greet me. And they were so kind. And, and uh, you know, getting getting them is like just one on one to interview them was sometimes hard. Uh, but uh, they were very forthcoming and uh, very um, uh, you know, those memories were seared into their minds just like with the American veterans um, with a vividness that, you know, like it is the most vivid thing in their life. They, they will never forget what they said and saw and did uh, and what was done to them uh, during those, during those four years. Uh, and the Filipinos were being very proud of their uh, association with Americans. There was a real warmth there. Uh, you know, I know the American Filipino relationship has been a, you know, Stormy in, in the past, but uh, the, the bond between these, you know, former guerrillas and former soldiers and the, and, and their American counterparts uh, was was 
so obvious and, and palpable and, and moving to see. I, I The first trip that I did to the Philippines, I went with a group of um, uh, Bataan and Corregidor veterans uh, who went on a tour. It's called Valor Tours. I, I Perhaps you've heard of them. I don't think they, I think they still exist. And uh, they, they, they put together these trips to different battlefields. And I went with them. And so it was like a rolling seminar on World War II because I was just surrounded by veterans uh, who had served in, in, in all these places that I was writing about for the book. Um, so it was, it was great research. But we get off at each stop, including um, uh, I mean, we went to Mount Samant. We went to Combatant Tawan. We went to Camp O'Donnell. We went out to Corregidor. We went all these places. And everywhere you went, uh, you, the civilians came out of the woodwork to greet them. And always there would be veterans uh, uh, from, from the war, Filipino mm -hmm. veterans. And whenever possible, I would interview them. And um, it, was, it helped the book enormously, I think, to get that point of view. And, and it was wonderful to see. So thanks for that question. Hampton, this is from me. I've always wondered, uh, did, did Hoson and Pahota and maybe some of their you know, higher ranking um, officers in their guerrilla movement, did they get um, a, a medal or you know, uh, any awards from the U.S. government? I'm pretty sure now, it's been a long time since I, uh, you know, since the book was published, but I know there was a movement to give both Hosan and um, Pohota um, sort of the, the equivalent of the distinguished, I think it's called the Distinguished Cross. Um, but it was, um, whether that ever happened, I, you know, I really don't know. I should research that. Um, I know that there was, um, you know, these, what these guerrilla leaders did was, was, generally speaking, not acknowledged, not sufficiently acknowledged, um, because, you know, and particularly these two, but because the Cabana Tuan raid was so kind of popular when it happened and was talked about, um, I believe, you know, there was a movement to, to make sure that at least those two leaders got awards, and I believe they did. I believe they did of some sort. I have to get back to you on which, which ones they were. When I was in uh, the Philippines, I did interview... I believe it was his daughter <coughs> or son, uh, and, and several cousins, you know, several family members. They were just, you know, obviously so proud of him and, uh, and what he had done during the war. But he had unfortunately already passed away uh, when I was there. Yeah, it's really interesting how uh, this was all done voluntarily, right, by Hoson and Pahota yeah. and their man. And you know what struck me when I read your book was that um, they were not just their loyalty and their, and their faith in the Americans, but when they were marching from their earliest point, so Hassan met with Musi, I remember that, and then when they were marching, Hassan's men flanked, flanked the Rangers, both right, uh, on the right and the left and the, the rear to protect them. Imagine that, huh? I must have been, you know, something for the Rangers. Were you able to talk to some Rangers about their, you know, uh, reminiscences about you know, the Filipino guerrillas then, would you have any um, uh, memories on that? How, how did they perceive the, the Filipino guerrillas who helped them? Well, they, you know, they obviously, they've, they understood that the raid would not have succeeded. There's no way possible that it would have succeeded without the guerrillas. Um, but not only in the positive sense that they, you know, they did everything to help and including fighting that, that fairly fierce fight along the river uh, against the Japanese, but it, it only would have taken one Filipino guerrilla or, or one Filipino civilian to spill the beans and go to the Japanese at Cabana Tawan city. And for a price, perhaps, um, uh, you know, maybe they get paid to give over this intelligence. Uh, and that would have been the end of the raid. So it, it required absolute loyalty from every single guerrilla and every single civilian, uh, which says something about, you know, the way they felt about American, um, uh, American culture, I guess. Uh, you know, the, the sovereignty movement had already begun and was well on its way. And I, I believe that, you know, the Japanese, I mean, you know, the, uh, the Filipinos didn't know what was in store for them if they were to, 
stay under the rule of the Japanese. Um, so they love, I guess they love the Americans more, even if it was a complicated relationship, there was some genuine connection there that was yes. not there, uh, was not there with the Japanese. Um, and so uh, that loyalty, you know, just, it would have taken one trader, one, one person willing to go and hand over a note or something, and the, the raid would have been a complete disaster, probably a bloodbath. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the American, the rangers that I interviewed um, understood um, that the guerrillas were real heroes in this thing, that they fought very well. I mean, by this point, they had been in a lot of firefights. They knew what they were doing in a just strict military sense. Um, they weren't very well equipped, of course, because they were, had guns that had been <coughs> uh, put together and cannibalized from other parts of other guns. And, you know, they didn't have excellent equipment, but they they fought bravely. And um, the risk they were taking was double that of any American that was fighting there. Because let's face it, if if their name got out to the Japanese, they, they would be killed. But so would like their families, uh, their, their villages <laughs> might be wiped yes. out. Um, so they were taking huge, a huge risk by siding with the Americans in such a dramatic way. Um, but that's what they did. And, uh, so for that reason, um, the Americans just had a kind of a, they would get tearful, you know, talking about that that trust they, they came to have for, for all the, the, the guerrillas. I mean, they, they, dis they disagreed a little bit on strategy. You know, what was the, should we do it at night? Should we do it in the morning? Should we do it at dawn or dusk? You know, um, should we come in from the West? Should we come in from the East? You know, there was, there were some arguments, I think, between uh, Musi and Pahoda about precisely how to go about the raid uh, and perhaps there was a little bit of dismissal, like uh, Musi was pretty arrogant guy, <laughs> very cocksure of himself. And uh, he probably didn't listen to Hosan as much as he should have, um, since Hosan knew every inch of that terrain, <laughs> every inch of it. But um, but anyway, it, it obviously it worked out well in the end. So, uh, And uh, by the way, Hosan... Um, was played in the movie by um, by um, Cesar Montano. Montano. Cesar Montano, and yeah. I got to meet. Oh, Pajota, Pajota. Pajota was played by Cesar Montano. Pajota. Did yes. I say Hosan? Pajota uh, was, and I got to hang out with him and uh, his wife at the time. He was, I guess, like uh, the Tom Cruise of the Philippines at the time. <laughs> I don't know, if it's still a big deal, or <laughs> what happened to him? I don't know what happened to him, but. He was a, uh, he's a very charming guy. And we went out to dinner and got to hang out a little bit. And uh, I thought he was really interesting. I, I don't know where, where he is now or what's happened to him, but. <laughs> I think he still does movies. I don't know. Well, uh, an amazing, uh, uh, interesting anecdote about Cesar Montano when he was interviewed here and was asked, um, how did you think you bagged the role, you know, in the auditions? Why, why did they choose you? And what he, his answer was, I think it's because, you know, because of my English. <laughs> uh -huh. He didn't speak that well. And he said maybe it was more authentic, something like that. Or he had a, a thick accent, probably. <laughs> okay. Anyway, okay. we've got a tons of questions here. We'll try to uh, go over the more important ones. All right. This is a nice story for those who don't know the, the you know, what happened to the POWs much. This is from Stick Davis. What happened hmm. to the thousands of POWs? Maybe he met from the death march. Who were at Kabanatuan, such that only such that only 516 were rescued from the thousands okay. from the death march and uh, Corregidor and yeah, uh, well, um, good question. Um, so you know, I think they say 2,600 and something died in Kabanatuan camp. Um, I'm talking about American casualties now or deaths now. Uh, and they died from starvation or from disease or, you know, malnutrition. Um, and, um, but the rest of the able-bodied prisoners of war were taken in a series of ships that are known as the hell ships um, to work in uh, slave labor camps 
elsewhere in um, Japanese controlled Asia. I think they were taken to Korea and they were taken to China and they were taken to um, Japan, the main, you know, the mainland of, of, of Japan to work in these prison war camps or in labor camps. Um, so what it was a dwindling down, the numbers dwindled down to that 500 only because those were the sick ones who couldn't, they didn't think would be very good workers. Uh, and, or, or they, you know, they were so diseased that they, they just couldn't, couldn't work in those slave camps. So they were left. Uh, they were the last remnants. Um, I also should say that I don't know how many thousands died in those hell ships that were taken to those other locations. Uh, unfortunately, the Americans, in many cases, several of the cases that are quite well known, um, bombed these ships, thinking they were Japanese ships, so they bombed them, not knowing that there were thousands of American POWs in the holds of those ships. Um, the Orioku Maru, I guess, is maybe the most famous one, but there are a number of them that, um, that um, that's just the ultimate tragedy to think about, that they... <coughs> full of Americans and it was the Americans who sank these ships, torpedoed them or uh, bombed them. Um, some of them made it all the way to work camps in Japan, including uh, one at Hiroshima, uh, one near Nagasaki. And so there are Americans who made it to those camps only to be incinerated by nuclear bomb, you know, an atomic bomb and they're, and, you know, dropped by their, <laughs> their own country. So, I mean, the tragedy just, the tragedies of this core tragedy the, being the death march and, and the camps seem to radiate outward in so many other directions uh, and never, you know, it's just unbelievable how, how sort of they almost make, you know, they make it through all of this hell and then they finally, you know, like they are incinerated by an atomic bomb or, or, or whatever, but that seems to actually have been the case with so many of the, these guys. Now, also, they, those who made it home, man, they spent the rest of their lives processing it and dealing with it and uh, trying to heal from it uh, as best they could uh, because these men saw not only all the worst of warfare, but then they saw the worst of the prison, you know, a captivity experience, which is, is really tough, you know, the starvation and the uh, just, just the gratuitous brutality. And, you know, it's like, why, why, Jap why did the Japanese mistreat them so much, so badly? That's a deep question that's asked by a lot of people. It just seemed like so much of it was gratuitous. Um, it was just, they didn't need, they didn't need to starve them. There's plenty of food in the Philippines, <laughs> but they chose to. <laughs> Everything grows in the Philippines. Um, so, uh, it's, it's stuff like that, that haunt these men, uh, haunted them till the you know, end of their days. Right. Yeah. Um, it's really horrific and unimaginable the atrocities that they, uh, committed both to the mm -hmm. troops and to the Filipino civilians. Well, mm -hmm. uh, for our, our viewers, um, February 3, last Thursday, marked the 77th anniversary of the start of the Battle of Manila. That's a whole month of fighting, urban fighting in Manila, which resulted in 100,000 Filipino civilians dead. Uh, a lot of our, you know, cream of the crop, a lot of our doctors, lawyers, you know, um, student leaders, businessmen died during that battle. And mm -hmm. uh, most of them really for, from, was from Japanese uh, uh caused by the Japanese, uh, you know, personal beheadings, you know, uh, beatings, tortures, and even scalping. I saw a picture, I was really shocked when I saw a picture of a dead Filipino with its, with scalp, with its scalp out and just lying beside him. I didn't know that the Japanese did that until I saw that picture. James Scott sent that to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, um, maybe we'll just tackle a few, one more question. There are a lot of questions, but... Um, what is the nicest one here? <laughs> it's my daughter collating all the questions. Oh, um, Hampton, were the reports yeah. of civilians around the camp massacred after the raid? 
because this was so in many of uh, of uh, American operations then and American and Filipino guerrilla operations. You know, when they are they are successful in a battle, after that the whole town suffers. Were there um, uh, reports of of that around the, the Cabanatuan Nueva Ecija area, or was it uh, I never already heard under that. American? I never heard that reported once. Um, but it may have been that because, um, you know, they were, by the time the raid took place, so it started out, the lines were about 30 miles away. By the time the raid was over, the, the, the lines had moved another, say, 10 miles. So it was more like 20 miles away. So by that point, most of the Japanese forces were making, you know, they were they were moving fast to the north. They were getting the hell out of there. So... I don't, you know, I don't, I've never heard reports. I could be wrong on this though, uh, but I've never heard reports of, of, of massacres of civilians for, for, you know, having participated in this thing. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I never heard of any such reports. Um, in fact, also there was one POW who um, was British. I, I mentioned this in the book. He was a British POW. I guess he'd been a civilian. And somehow was in that camp that night and he was through malnutrition. He had lost, basically lost his eyesight. And he also was hard of hearing. He had been at the latrine uh, that night of the raid. Uh, I think he had a little dysentery or something and poor guy. And, you know, he was also, you know, a little older uh, than the, the rest. And he m- completely missed the raid. He did all that gunfire, the grenades, the bazookas, uh, all the fighting and yelling and screaming. He missed it all. He went back to his his barracks, and uh, it was empty. He couldn't figure out why is everybody, where is everybody? <laughs> he barely could see. So he just went to bed and spent the last night in the camp. And so the next day, he wakes up and walks, just walked out of there by himself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not exactly sure where he walked to, but um, by that point, my point is the Japanese soldiers had moved on by, you know, from really the next day, sometime by the next afternoon. Um, and then maybe that's why there were no reports of civilian casualties uh, after the raid. Yeah. Uh, remember Hampton and you were speaking the other day and I told you that. In many parts of the book, I was so irked at Musi. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. How, how do you view his, you know, he, he, at many points, he would look down militarily on Pahota and, uh, you know, kept repeating instructions and to the point that Pahota kind of like raised his voice and said, we will, sir, something like that. Uh, what, what were your views on that? Did, was he just uninformed of, of, of the guerrilla you know, the things that the grid has been do have been doing for the last three years, or how, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a lot of different views on Musi. Some people said that he had a little bit of a Napoleon complex because he was short. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he was a short, wiry little guy that with a real temper. Uh, he was Italian. <laughs> I don't, I'm not making any stereotypes, but he had an Italian personality. He was. Tr- dramatic and uh he was uh charismatic too and um so he had to be right you know when he made a pronouncement he was right and everyone else was wrong um and that unfortunately i think is common in in many military situations uh because you're a commander you have to project at least a, a certain determination and a certain you know demeanor of of certitude um but um, and I think he probably was patronizing toward Pahota and Hutsan. He probably was un- uninformed about just how m- much they had done over the course of the war to stymie the Japanese uh, occupation and you know how many risks they had taken and how much they had learned about how to fight that certain kind of warfare. Uh, so yeah, I think he was. I think. Uh, you could you could accuse Musi of being patronizing <laughs> and dismissive <laughs> of Hosan. Um and maybe that's racial too. Uh, I'm an American. I'm arrogant. Uh, we know what we're doing. 
who are you guys? But maybe it was more just um, maybe a little bit of institutional um, pride that I'm an Ar- I'm a U.S. Army Ranger ca- commander, and you what are you guys? You are you're a ragtag bag of civilians with guns that you know don't even work half the time. Uh, you know we're well equipped and we're well trained, and who are you guys? A bunch of a bunch of scruffy <laughs> gorilla. But the gorilla is obviously. I mean so. But the gorillas obviously knew what they were doing. Um, right. So, and and this goes for some of the Americans who had commanded uh, guerrilla troops. <coughs> uh, uh, like, um, I mean, there were a number of them that uh, were not treated that well by the American high command because they were irregular. They're diff- mm-hmm. They're out there in the field. They're they're uh, they've gone native. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Was there ever? laughs> But it, uh-huh. there, was, there was like a, just they were dismissing a little bit dismissive of some of the American commanders, just as they were of Pahota and Hosan for being kind of, you know, outside the the norm of military thinking and training and all that. But right. it's kind of an interesting um, dichot, dichotomy. Maybe that was why I I so took to your book because I love the the parts where you really showed the. <laughs> Uh, the Filipino effort, you know, Pahota's battle with the with the Japanese at the Kabu River, you know, the the bridge, I was amazing, huh? And uh, he had this bazooka bazooka man. Pahota had this bazooka man who was just taught how to use the bazooka that afternoon. Yeah. And then that night he scored, you know, several direct hits, uh, hitting a, a, a trans a, 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 a truck, a Japanese truck, a tank. You know, yeah. it was wonderful. I, I really appreciate you putting all that. Plus the other Filipinos who helped all the townspeople, you know, how many towns they had to pass through and all of them helped in their own way, uh, giving food, giving aid, you know, helping carry the POWs, um, what have you, even, you know, it's just that maybe it's, it's, it's because um, it really was, you know, a, a group effort, not just for the guerrillas, but also for the civilians, right? Oh, one last question before we go, Hampton. There is a question yeah. here that, did the Rangers think it was a suicide mission at the start? At the start, no, not knowing that the guerrillas will help them. Were there thoughts of that? Well, uh, most of the Rangers that I interviewed tend to be, um, you know, understated and super modest about all of this. They don't like Prince. He asked me several times, like, seriously, why are you writing this book? We didn't do anything remarkable. Really. Just, we we're just doing our job, you know, Wow. Uh, and they're, you know, kind of like <laughs> that is partly generational. I think that's just kind of the way they were. And it's also partly just the way Prince is, or I should say was um, as a human being, he was just very modest. Um, uh, so they, they weren't prone to, uh, you know, saying things like we saw it as a su- suicide mission. You know, we, we were going to, definitely we're going to die if we didn't, if everything wasn't perfect, you know, um, they, they were one, one thing to remember is just how young they were. You know, most of them were 19, you know, maybe they were 20. Uh, and I think Prince was just like 26. So, uh, you know, it's like, these were kids and they didn't really have a very, uh, when I was 26, I didn't have a real exaggerated sense of, my own mortality. <laughs> you know, I didn't think about things like, Oh, this is really dangerous or this is really risky. I just thought I, I just, I probably looking back on it, did a lot of stupid things when I was young. Uh, but youth will do that. So I think most of these guys weren't thinking this is a suicide mission until they got deeper into the mission. Then they began to realize, Oh gosh, there really are Japanese troops all around us, you know, they're we're outnumbered 10 to one at least i don't mean how many to one at least let's see well you know more than 10 to one um and we don't know i mean they had only recently landed in the philippines in luzon so they did not know or have any level of personal trust that the that the, the gorillas um would would fight with them and that the civilians would keep their mouth shut <laughs> about this. They really, they had to, you know, they <coughs> hoped and believed there was a possibility 
maybe they had heard a little bit about the Philippine resistance, but these were guys fresh off the boat. They didn't hardly know where they were. Um, it was like Mark Twain said, God created wars so Americans can learn their geography. <laughs> That's about, you know, these guys didn't know anything about the Philippines and how their culture and, you know, let, let alone whether the Filipino civilians would, uh, you know, would support them in this effort. Uh, so they had to learn on the ground. Um, they also were, you know, worried about that exposure element that I mentioned earlier that, you know, it's one thing to crawl up to a camp when you, you have a, true stealth, uh, but another when you have visibility, when everyone can see you for hundreds of yards, uh, if, if, you know, so it's, um, that's the, that's when I think that's the moment when they saw that topography, that flat plane, that's when they thought, oh my God, this could be a suicide mission. And this is really dangerous. Holy shit. (laughs) Oh, can I say that? (laughs) Uh, really, uh, that was the moment I think that, that, that everyone, when I interviewed them, they said they did a big gulp and they just said, Oh, this is dangerous. Wow. You know, right. uh, cause there were, the guard towers were a good bit elevated a good bit over, over that field and it would have been bad. But um, anyway, thanks for the question. <laughs> really? If, uh, for those who has, haven't seen a, a Philippine flatland or a rice field, it is flat and you know, even a, a smallest animal can be seen from miles away. So it was really a dangerous mission. Uh, before we go, um, my friend Tonette Rivera, he's a, he, he flies, he's a pilot. He said he has a comment for you, Hampton. When you're back yeah. in the Philippines, I can fly you over the camp and the surrounding area. Even after, 77, if the, even after 77 years, the terrain and aerial view still reflects the terrain features and the camp outline. I do believe wow. so. I've been there just uh, just before the pandemic. <coughs> and for those of you who can visit the the Kabanatuan uh, Memorial there, there's two memorials, one American and one Filipino, side by side. The Filipino one, I went there in the early 2010s. It was really beautiful with a uh, like bronze uh, plaques that I didn't know it was a sundial thing. You know, so it's like a circle and it tells that the, uh, the, the ray, like a... a like a time um, time lapse thing of ha- what happened, and then I didn't know there was this uh, thing on top that it serves as a sundial thing, and it's really beautiful. So I was sad when I went there, went back there in 2019, just before the pandemic. It has fallen into disrepair. So I think this is a shout out to the Nueva Ecija government, you know, uh, to please um, rehabilitate this. The American uh, memorial is still there. The the only thing that's <laughs> left of the camp there was the the we call this the, the water the water tank the the foundation of the water tank is still there uh, mm-hmm. now that we're you know able to go out now free more freely for those of you who are interested you can go and see all right so that has been our question and answer portion thank you hampton this has been a an amazing uh one hour and a half for me uh and made and especially so for all our audience a lot of them you know um skipped work just to be here <laughs> Yeah, me too. I've enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. And I wish I could have been there much. with you in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. Right, right. Thank you very much for your time. I know you're very, very busy. Hampton is researching now for his next book, but he, you know, he made time for us. Thank you so much. And before we go, we'd like to, um, to um, ask our viewers, this is our last chance to uh, join or to, to uh, our online signature campaign. Uh, we're, we're flashing the, the slide now for the change.org poster. Uh, if you all, all, all of you might probably have known, heard from now that uh, the Banco Central or the Central Bank of the Philippines will be removing our three World War II heroes from our 1,000 peso bill, which I think is a very wrong move, and we'll be replacing it with the Philippine Eagle. Uh, well, I have no... You know, personal contentions about the eagle is a very majestic and, you know, beautiful creature, but it doesn't quite replace the values that the three heroes, you know, gives to the Filipino people. The 1,000 peso bill serves as a you know, quick history lesson for every one of us, and, and it reminds us of the Filipinos' patriotism and love for country, and let us not let the central bank do this. Let us, let, let us um, 
sign the signature, the campaign, please go to change.org. The campaign's name is No to the Removal of Our World War II Heroes. Please sign as we will be um, lodging this campaign, lodging this uh, petition to the Central Bank in a few days. Please help us share it and have your friends and family sign as well. Um, let us, BSP or the Central Bank should know that the overwhelming majority of the Filipino people is against this. Um, and uh, for our next episode on February 26th, we'll be having James Scott, a good friend of Hampton as well. For episode three, James Scott will be talking about the Battle of Manila, which we said earlier started actually two days ago, February 3, 1945. Um, and um, the, the initial part of that uh, Battle of Manila, the first would be the, the rescue of the civilians. So it was in January 30, the POWs were rescued from Cabanatuan. And in February 3, uh, the Allied civilians were rescued from USD and then from Belibid. So it was, um, you know, <clears throat> a, very, a tremendous, uh, probably a, for, for the returning American troops, probably a source of tremendous joy at that time. And, um, we, we entice you to watch our, our next episode on March, uh, February 26th at 8 p.m. That will be 8 p.m. We will ha be having James Scott with us. And um, for our other episodes, for we'll be, we're in lining up the speakers for second quarter. We'll be having Peter Parsons to talk about his dad, Commander Chick Parsons, and his submarine missions here from Australia to resupply the guerrillas. Uh, we'll be having Glenn Williford, who wrote his book, Pacific Rampart, on, about Corregidor. We'll be having Glenn on May. And in June, we might be having my good friend, Mike Banyos. <coughs> ah, yeah, you're watching now. Uh, Mike Banyos will talk about the war in Mindanao. So um, please like our Facebook page. We'll post and keep you updated on our upcoming schedules. And um, we don't have much time. Uh, thank you again, Hampton. This has been a wonderful experience. Not just for me, but for the entire audience, I'm sure of it, who <laughs> I told you, who took time off really to, to watch you today. Uh, would you have some um, like parting words or la uh, you know, farewell remarks for our audience before we finally close the show? Whoops. Sorry, our team might probably have lost connection. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Hampton. Uh, thank you so much. A lot of people are thanking thanking you in the, the chat box and the comment section and, and uh, saying how they enjoyed the episode. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. We'll see you on episode three, February 26th, about the Battle of Manila by James Scott. See you then. And to all, thank you uh, for tuning in and stay safe.